Este, bienvenidos, como dice Jesús, somos sus anfitriones aquí, gracias por venir. No solo hay compradores, también hay gente de tecnología y gente de finanzas aquí. Entonces, no puedo competir con los chistes de Jesús de compradores porque me, me, me puede ganar muy fácilmente. Eh, la verdad es de que, como dice Jesús, sí llevamos ya tiempo tratando de hacer algo como esto. Eh, yo llevo cinco años con los Pen Matters. De hecho, este, es algo que en México no teníamos. ¿Sí? y esperemos ahorita en la presentación que va a dar Jason este, va a hablar un poquito también sobre Spen Mares esto lo va a dejar un poquito, él es el fundador de, de, de Spen Mares junto con Lisa y pues la primera vez que están en México espero que al final se lleven algo se lleven algo, como yo digo, un chicle para mascar ahí mentalmente y creemos que algo, algo bueno va a salir de esto más allá de, 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 de convivir y pueda hacer algún tipo de relacionamiento aquí entonces, este, vamos a empezar. No estamos completos todavía, pero estamos la mayoría. Entonces, este, sin, sin mayor preámbulo, eh, les voy a presentar a Jason Bush. Jason Bush, eh, you have mic, right? Ok, Jason Bush, es, como les dije, es el fundador de Azul, es fundador de Azul Partners y cofundador de Spell Matters. Él, este pues ahorita está contribuyendo principalmente en la elaboración de Solution Maps. Es, es, una, es, es, es un producto en donde comparamos soluciones de tecnología. Este, antes de esto, él, fue, él trabajó en Free Markets, no sé si ustedes recuerdan Free Markets. Algo interesante de Jason es que él tiene una visión muy diferente de lo que... Este, podríamos tener nosotros a veces en Latinoamérica y es que él conoce a la gente que fundó las empresas, dónde están invirtiendo, por qué están invirtiendo, quién las compró. Tienen otra visión de, 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 de cómo inició muchos mucho temas de, 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 de compras y de tecnología. Entonces va a ser muy interesante y ojalá y sea algo este, muy productivo para ustedes. Eh, Jason, odio usted. Twitter as how you manage your supply. 
suppliers and negotiate. And these are actual, oh, sorry guys. Um, I'm coordinating two computers at once here, so uh, I'll go back to this. Um, so, President Trump believes that Twitter is actually a way you negotiate with your suppliers. And this is something that I can't make up, but li literally telling a supplier on Twitter that we're going to cancel the order. And I think that's pretty funny. But you know, the, the greater irony of the situation is that it actually worked. Boeing actually did negotiate and bring down the price afterwards. But still, I find that kind of funny. But fortunately, Twitter was never designed to be a source to pay platform. And uh, I should apologize here for my president's tactics in general, if not his actions. But you will hear from Lisa later that actually what is happening right now with manufacturing in the US and procurement and supply chain, we believe strategically is going to be very positive for Mexico and Latin America, generally speaking. Um, that the big losers are going to be China and Korea um, for a whole bunch of reasons. But I'll leave that to Lisa as the economics and policy sourcing person. I'm just the technology geek. So, what am I going to cover? I want to start with some really boring slides, but I think it's important to level set around the source to pay process definition. So, that's where we're going to start. Then, I'm going to translate process to technology and get into defining and segmenting the source to pay technology landscape. And then last, I'm going to talk about how do you buy technology? Um, it used to be quite easy. 10, 15 years ago, for ERP systems, we largely had two choices if we were bigger companies. We could go with SAP, or we could go with Oracle. Or if we were a small manufacturer, we could go with J.D. Edwards or Sage or someone else. But today, there are so many technologies, and a lot of them are really great. And I'm not just meaning, meaning to say that. I'll tell you some personal stories as we talk about the technologies on how bad they used to be. I work for a company which was a great company, but it developed some very bad technology at one point. So I'll tell you some funny stories. So, Javier gave a quick introduction to us and my background a little bit. Um, the organization we run uh, has got a few different brands within the procurement and supply chain market. So we cover procurement technology very deeply. We also cover the commodity supply chain through Metaliner. And then we are doing a lot, and I spend more and more of my time in the US with public sector, government procurement, because I think a secret to better government is not presidents who tweet or reactionary presidents, but actually better procurement, because I think if governments can buy better, everybody wins. And that site is called Public Spend Forum. So, as I promised, I'm going to show some really ugly, boring slides to begin with. Um, and everything that I'm going to share is available. So you can ask Jesus, you can ask Javier, you can ask me. Um, just give us your business card or let us know you want the presentation. So don't worry, worry about taking notes, especially on the ugly slides. But here's where I need to start. I used to be a consultant, and I like to tell people I'm, I'm, I'm doing penance for having been a consultant earlier in my career by trying to simplify things today around technology. But I still believe we need to go back to consulting methodologies around how one buys technology. And before we even say we need a system for sourcing or we need a transactional procurement system, we need to think about our internal processes as a company. And this is just one um, process diagram workflow. I'm going to show a little bit more of it in a minute, um, which we created with an organization called PRGX that we do a lot of work with. It's a consultancy. Um, and every consultancy and every company will have their own version of this. AT Kearney has their own version, McKinsey has their own version. Um, you know, Coca-Cola, FEMSA, Caterpillar, you name it. Every company will have their own version of this. But the procurement process starts with alignment. And for us, alignment is very much about data. 
So we'll map back to that later on. Then we need to think about sourcing. And sourcing itself is very complicated today. There are so many elements. It's not just about negotiation. In fact, negotiation is a tiny, is a tiny piece of it. Contracting, right? Contracting is not just creating a piece of paper with lawyers, getting people to negotiate it and sign it and putting it in a file cabinet. Contracting is exceptional in terms of what you can do with it. Contract management can actually set up all of the obligations and performance criteria by which you will manage your suppliers and your suppliers will manage you if you do it right. And then we get into what I call transactional procurement activities, so purchasing. Many people buy within a company. Within procurement, we have buyers, but then within the business, we have every employee, and increasingly in white-collar organizations, every employee from an administrative assistant, an executive assistant, to a CEO will buy things on their own. So purchasing is not just something that procurement does. Yes, for materials and parts and components, it's procurement. But purchasing is about what the business does as well. And then we also must think about managing our suppliers. Supplier management is incredibly complicated too. Supplier management is about performance management, it's about data management, it's about risk management, it's about compliance management. It has many different areas. And from a process standpoint, it really encompasses the life cycle of what we do in procurement. And in North America, it's becoming much more important in the US right now, for example, as an investment area in technology. And then we need to think about, across the entire process, how do we tie things together? Um, and just some very quick examples, and I'm not going to go through all of these. Um, again, the slides are available. But when we think about alignment, we need to think about how we not only have data to drive sourcing strategy, but how do we align with budgeting and planning internally? One of the biggest jokes historic, historically in procurement is there will be a management team meeting in a company and procurement will say after they on their own or through working with a consulting firm, you know, we saved $30 million on $1 billion of spend through better sourcing in the meeting. And then the CFO will say, we saved $30 million. I don't see it. It didn't come out of, of, of the P&L. And procurement will say, no, we saved it. But it never dropped to the bottom line. So alignment is all about those upfront pieces and bringing groups together. We'll talk about sourcing technology later, but again, many different elements. Same with contracting and supplier management and transactional purchasing. And then we get into the broader elements of fulfillment um, and payment. Payment itself, even in the US right now, is what I would call a giant black hole. Most procurement organizations, when they click the approve to pay an invoice button, have no idea when that supplier will get paid, even if there are defined terms. And even if there is a discounting program in place to pay that supplier early, they do not know when the payment run will be. They can't promise that the wire details or the ACH details are correct. So when we talk about broader alignment and source to pay components, we extend all the way through to payment and the management and enablement of suppliers as well. So the ugliest slide of all is the next one, which I won't even pretend to go through. But if you want a definition of each of these areas, if you don't have one or you're looking for what I would describe as a third party to compare yours to, this is one example. I won't say ours is better than anyone else. I think there are better ones than ours out there too. But it's nice to compare these things. And if for some reason you have not created a process definition, feel free to take these and use them as your own. OK, so this is the part which I enjoy and where I get to spend a lot of my time these days, which is looking at actual technology. So what I'm going to do is go through each of the technology areas when we think about source to pay. But what I want to impress upon you to begin with is that you, even though your backgrounds are, are in business and finance and other areas, really need to think of 
about learning technology. This is something that heads of procurement and CFOs in the U.S. are versed in. Um, not everyone, but it's becoming much more commonplace that you can talk to a CPO or a CFO about their e procurement system. You can talk to them about their payment strategy and their technology to enable it. They will know. They don't have to talk to someone else. And the reason for that is technology now exists to serve the business. It doesn't exist to serve IT organizations. And there's a couple major reasons for this. One is what we call digitization um, within the procurement function. Increasingly, we're spending more, and I put on my United States hat, we're spending more on technology and less on resources. When, um, and I like to pick on names, when Marge, a buyer who's 65 years old, retires and she moves to, we would joke, she would move to Florida um, for her retirement, Marge is not replaced. There is not a 20-year-old coming in and taking Marge's job. Marge is replaced with technology. And the people we're hiring in procurement are ex-consultants. They are folks who studied supply chain management in university. And they are savvy around digital. So that is one key trend. The other major trend is what we call externalization, which is companies are not just relying more on procurement, they're relying more on their suppliers for everything they do. And there are some great examples here going back over a decade. So it used to be if I were GE, or excuse me, if I were Boeing or I were Airbus, and I was buying an aircraft engine, or my customers were, so if I were Aeromexicana or United Airlines and specifying an airplane, I would buy uh, the, basically the chassis. I'd, I'd buy the plane, and I'd buy the seats, and I'd buy the engine. But what's happened with, with aircraft engines is that you're no longer buying the engine. You're buying 1,000 hours of uptime. You're buying 5,000 hours of uptime. And the maintenance associated with it. So it used to be the procurement had to negotiate. And it wasn't, you know, comparing a Rolls-Royce uh, engine to a GE engine. They're not identical, but you can still negotiate. Now you're comparing a contract for five or ten years for all the service associated with it as well. And how reliable will it be? Um, so that is externalization. And that ties to the point we're buying everything in our business as a service. We like to say software has become a service. It's not something we put within uh, our technology uh, building. Um, we're buying it in the cloud, but we're buying more as a business as a service too. So procurement needs to do what information and technology organizations previously did, since we as the business are driving the need. Um, and one of my favorite statistics of all, super simple, so if you look at Spend Matters data, if you look at Hackett Group data, which is another research firm, if you look at McKinsey data, everyone converges on the notion that procurement has a return on investment of 5 to 10 to 1. So every new dollar you put into procurement, you're going to get between 5 and 10 dollars out. And increasingly, the, the I of ROI investment is going into technology. It's not going into people, it's going into technology. So procurement must become digital. And we all, even if we're not comfortable with systems in the past, we need to become technology masters ourselves. And again, this is something that in the US, in the UK, in Germany, in France as well, um, we're seeing more and more procurement executives become very well versed in technology. Sure, they're not going to go in and configure a system on their own, but they will understand the differences between them and what they can do. So we segment the technology landscape and this process into six different modules, which I'll go through today, and what we call suites as well. And all a suite is, is a combination of different types of modules you can buy. And you don't need to buy them all from one provider. You can buy them from multiple providers. Or you can buy them from one provider. There is not one right choice. It will depend on the organization. But the areas I'm going to talk about today are spend analysis, sourcing, and we'll define each of these, 
contract life cycle management, supplier management, e-procurement, and invoice to pay. And then we'll talk about a little bit how one can assemble these into different suites. So if you want what we call strategic procurement technology, that is the combination of spend analysis, sourcing, <coughs> contract management, and supplier management. If you want procure to pay, that's the combination of e-procurement and invoice to pay. And if you want source to pay, that's everything there. And now just to get a little bit more complicated, I'm not going to go through this today, but we can also add another mix into this too, which is services procurement. The buying of SKU-based products, whether we're buying MRO, or we're buying IT equipment, or we're buying resin, or we're buying um, you know, steel sheet, or we're buying uh, a printed circuit board, has a lot of similarities. Even if it's, again, something someone in the business is buying on their laptop because they need it, or someone in the factory is buying. SKUs are generally SKUs. And there's specialization of technology within that, for sure. But services are very different. How we buy services, how your company would negotiate and contract with Accenture for outsourcing, for example, how you would negotiate um, with JLL or Cushman Wakefield for property management, how you buy services is very different. So we actually have a different set of technologies we review and look at for services. And we segment it into three types of services, and the technology systems are different to support them. So there is temporary labor. So that is, um, you know, the management of staffing firms. We also look at contracted services and statement of work. So that would be the management of Accenture or JLL. Um, and then we look at really kind of the hottest area right now, um, if you read the newspapers, what we call independent contract workers. How many folks in the room, just by show of hands, have, have taken an Uber before? Excellent. So Uber uses independent contract workers. That is their workforce. And when you use independent contract workers, you still need to source them. You're not negotiating necessarily the rate. You can set that. But you still need to make sure they're in compliance. So that is a huge new area right now of technology investment in North America because more companies are going straight to the individual resource when they buy services. So if you ever want to talk about this, please find Javier or me. This is something we cover a lot. We're not going to do it today because it falls a little bit outside of our box, but it's important nonetheless. So let's begin by looking at what we call strategic procurement technologies. So spend analysis, sourcing, contract lifecycle management, and supplier management. Um, so Spend Matters itself, the, 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 the site I founded and research firm I founded, um, has a lot of content that is completely free. You can go to Spend Matters Mexico Latin America. You can go to spendmatters.com. And this is one report that I wrote with two of my colleagues um, last year. It's a free report, you can just download it, on the landscape definition of these four areas. And I'm going to go through some of this today. But if you want uh, background for your organization to explain it, this paper goes through it. So let's start with spend analysis. What I'm going to do, and forget about the charts, I just stuck them up there now. In about 15, 20 minutes, we're going to talk about charts and why everything you know about how vendors are ranked by Gartner and Forrester and others is completely wrong. And it's not that the analysts are wrong. They have very smart people, probably smarter than Javier and me. But the notion of one chart is wrong for a whole lot of reasons. But we'll talk about that later. And as we think about charts, we actually produce five or six for every area we cover. And we do it every quarter because that's how fast the market changes. So we'll talk about that later. Um, but I want to talk now about spend analysis. So spend analysis is a set of technologies which provides visibility into what your organization has bought. And it's not as simple as just taking an extract 
uh, from your payables file from SAP. Because this data exists in many places. It exists uh, in invoice data from your suppliers. It exists in purchasing card data from American Express and Visa. So you need to combine these data sets and then make sense of them. And ideally, you need to do it very frequently as well. Best practice in the US is taking an update of these data sets every week or two and having visibility from all these systems literally every week or two. So you know exactly what you spent and then you can classify it to whatever taxonomy you want. It could be manufacturer's code, coding, you know, in terms of how your plant wants to see it. It could be what is called UNSPSC, which is a definition, a uh, standard taxonomy. It could be NASICS, which is another. It doesn't matter how you're going to look at it, but you want to be able to make sense of it. And then you want to be able to add data to your data. So you might want information from Dun & Bradstreet or other sources around how risky a supplier is. You might want other feeds as well to bring in. You might want a daily feed on currency prices because, you know, as we all know, there was a scandal recently with American Express overcharging corporate customers for currency exchanges. And so you need to make sure that if you're invoiced to one currency and you're paying in, in, in another, that it all makes sense in the end, and some party is not mischarging, uh, and banks do mischarge. So having all of this data together in one place is what we describe as spend analysis. Now, about 15 minutes ago, I lied to you about one thing, which was ugly slides. For each of these areas, I have a very ugly slide. Again, it's going to be in the document, but I think it's really important that I just want to talk through some elements of spend analysis and what comprises it. So when we think about the architecture of spend analysis, we start with the underlying platform. So that's analytics capability to visualize data. That's integration, in, you know, integrations into systems. Then we get into reports on top of it. So once we have our data, we need to build reports. I might want to see, um, you know, a Pareto order analysis of where my spending is going by category, by supplier. I might want to run a report on purchase price variance, understand exactly why I'm paying more in certain cases than others. And then I'll want to perform broader information analysis on all the data together. So this is how we think about the architecture of spend analysis. Let's go to sourcing. So of all the areas that I will cover today. Sourcing is probably the easiest one to decouple from everything else, um, which is good and it's bad, right? Because you can decouple it and you can get started with sourcing technology in a day or two. You can replace the manual process. But it's bad because sourcing is much more effective when it's coupled with other processes. But it's, it's, uh, it, it's, it's what we would call kind of a Faustian bargain to use sourcing technology without coupling it, but you can do it. So what is sourcing? Sourcing technology is a way to manage basic supplier data. It's a way to manage the RFI, RFP, and RFX process with your suppliers. It's different negotiation techniques. So the company I came from, Free Markets, in the 90s, which was really the first strategic sourcing provider at the time, Ariba ended up buying it, to have reverse auction software um, would literally pit suppliers against each other as if they were in a room bidding. What we all learned after that was sourcing technology and reverse auctions are useful for a small percentage of spend, but probably you're not going to bid to use that aircraft example, Rolls Royce against GE for that aircraft engine. They will laugh you out of the room if you do that. So we have other techniques and these tools for negotiation some of which get super cool. And I'm sorry to not use a technical word, but there are new technologies out around sourcing which let you collect flexible variables from suppliers. So you might not be able to specify everything in, in the RFI and RFX around lead time. So one supplier might have a 45 day lead time. One supplier might have a 90 day, day lead time. And you can't tell each one to bid precisely the same thing. One supplier might want to bid for a component slightly alternative specification materials. 
because that will save you 20%. So how do you collect all of that information and make sense of it? New sourcing tools enable you to do that as well. So when we think about sourcing, it's not just reverse auctions, it, it's all of these areas together. Um, and the best news about sourcing of all, there is not a bad technology provider out there, period. When I was at Free Markets, we had a very basic product that we sold called Source. I know there are some, I was looking at the list of who was here, and some organizations actually used it. Um, but we released a product uh, which was, I think, called Advanced Source or Full Source. And this was 15 or 20 years ago, and it didn't work. It, it simply didn't work. And that was very common back then. Sourcing technology from 15 years ago, a lot of it didn't work properly. But today, there is not a bad choice. Um, there are better choices if you want advanced capabilities. There's better choices if you want super easy to use. But you can get going tomorrow with sourcing and have something which is going to work. Sourcing for us, as we look at it, is a very complex area. So I'm not even going to try and go through this diagram here right now. Um, but what I would encourage you to think about, and we'll talk about this later on, is what do you value as a procurement organization? Do you value ease of use and something that people can walk up to and use? Do you want a technology that your supply chain organization can work with for complex multi-tier bids with procurement? So you need to think about what your profile is as you're selecting this technology, because based on that, you will go one way or the other. And again, there's not a bad choice. There's not a right choice. It's what your organization needs. So let's now move to contract lifecycle management. So what is contract management? Historically, and I think it probably makes sense to talk about how we manage contracts in the past. So our legal departments, we would have a general counsel. We might have external counsel. And they would draft contracts for our strategic supplier agreements. And then we would negotiate with suppliers. And they would draft it in Word, Microsoft Word, and use a redlining software for law firms, which allows lawyers to go back and forth. And they'd spend a few weeks. And if we used external counsel, you know, they would charge us between $400 an hour and $1,000 an hour. And we'd have a beautiful contract after a couple of weeks, which everyone agreed to. And then we'd take the contract and we'd put it away and we would never look at it again unless there was a lawsuit. Contract management changes that mission. Contract management technology says we should include legal in the process. They should drive it, in fact. But let's have a technology which lets procurement and suppliers and not just lawyers collaborate on the offering of a contract, but then specifies terms which you will then measure and monitor in the contract after uh, it's created. So then we can manage our relationship based on those contract terms. And we do not just file it away, um, but then we can actually work with our suppliers strategically. That's just one part of contract management. Another part is we have all of our smaller supplier agreements where our suppliers send us contracts and we just sign them. There are new contract management technologies designed for what we call supplier paper, or third-party paper, which analyze those smaller contracts coming from suppliers, and they tell you, is this contract horrible? Is it okay? Is it good? And then artificial intelligence will then prescribe, let's change this clause ever so slightly. And this may sound scary for complex strategic agreements, and we should never use it for those agreements, right? There's a place for lawyers to go back and forth, ideally with our input. But for agreements we never looked at before we just signed, it's beautiful, it's great that we have these systems which can look at contracts and tell us, should I sign this or not? So th this is what contract management is. And again, it, it's a way of bringing procurement and suppliers into the contracting process. Contract management itself is fairly complex in terms of all the systems components involved. So it begins with what we call contract discovery or contract analytics. Your organization probably has thousands upon thousands of contracts you in procurement do not know exist. But you need to find them. So in the legal profession, and I, I'm sorry I have lawyers in my family, 
and I, I hear about this from them, though fortunately I'm not a lawyer, um, that um, there are these products called e-discovery products, which are used in litigation. So you want to discover everything that somebody may have said in email or elsewhere. We now have the equivalent of e-discovery and contract management, too, which will go out and look within your organization for things which look like contracts. A contract could be an email. If you agree with a supplier to do something as a change order in an email, that's actually a contract. Now, whether it holds up in a legal system in a court is something else, but it's still an obligation which is set up by email, which may tie back to a master services agreement. So contract management begins with finding contracts. Then it begins with creating standards. So what standard is our legal organization willing to accept for indemnification? or warranties, or change of control. So we have to agree and set up standards. Then we move through to authoring a negotiation, so a tool to author and negotiate contracts with suppliers. And then we go through to monitoring everything that must happen. I know this sounds incredibly boring, like sourcing to me is more interesting, but actually contract management is hugely valuable. It's something that US companies are, are adopting quickly now, and it actually can deliver a return on investment because you can measure suppliers out of it and you can reduce your risk. So it has all of these components, but it's very valuable. So the next area we'll talk about is supplier management. So supplier management is really becoming what I would describe as the default methodology for managing the entire life cycle of suppliers. So just as we have a CRM system to manage customers and potential customers, we have a supplier management system to manage that process by which suppliers first meet our organization, whether we invite them to a bid or whether they go to our website and register, through to renewing contracts with suppliers as well. And everything that sits in between. So that's measuring our suppliers and supplies via supplier performance management and KPIs. It's development and collaboration with our suppliers for new ideas. Our strategic suppliers, again, might have a different material specification that they want to tell us. And they might say, hey, we can save you money if we can change the specification. That's supplier innovation management, and it's part of supplier management. And then we need to tie to other aspects of our organization around what we call master data management. So what is that golden record associated with that supplier? Today, it doesn't exist. You know, if, if your organization, and, and I'll pick on, Accenture is a bad example um, because it's a services company, but let's say you're working with, with IBM because IBM has many business lines today, and you wanted to know every interaction that your procurement organization, your finance organization, your supply chain organization, has had with IBM, and then every PO associated with IBM, and then all the right contact details. Who is that person in accounts receivable for IBM if I have a question about an invoice? What are their banking details? Today, you don't have one system of record for that. It's spread out everywhere. It's an ERP, it's an e-procurement, uh, it could be in other systems as well. What master data management and supplier management does is give you one view of that data and even create a system with, which then feeds your ERP and other systems to, to correct incorrect information. So that's why supplier management is so complex and broad. It has a lot of components to it. Um, and it's been an afterthought until recently. A lot of companies would buy a sourcing system or they'd buy an e-procurement system and say, I need supplier management as an add-on. But increasingly, companies are buying supplier management for compliance, for data management, and for other areas. I already talked about different elements of supplier management, but really four I'll call your attention to in a circle. So supplier management is about engagement with suppliers. How do we engage our suppliers initially? How do we capture those interactions? It's about supplier relationship management. How do we manage the relationships with suppliers over time? It's about supplier performance management. So how do we create a baseline of metrics from people in the company? So you may want something as simple as what is called a net promoter score. 
you might want to know how your colleagues think about that supplier qualitatively. And even though one person may be biased, 20 people, if you ask their opinion, is actually a good sample size. And then you may want to combine that data with systems data. So, Jose says, this is a great supplier. Megan says, ah, oh, this supplier is okay. But then I go to my SAP system and it says, this supplier is late on 80% of its orders and its defect rate is 40%. Well, you know what? If we have that data, that's not a good supplier. So we need to develop that supplier or get rid of that supplier. So that's what supplier performance management is. It's the combination of the qualitative data, so the soft data from your colleagues, and the hard data from systems. And then we get into supplier risk and compliance management. Certain industries spend more on risk and compliance for suppliers than they spend on sourcing and, and contract management and procurement combined. So if you're in the financial services industry, I can promise you, your organization, maybe not procurement, but legal or compliance, is spending a lot to make sure your suppliers are compliant with the needs of the bank or the insurance company. If you are an oil and gas company, um, you are spending a tremendous amount of compliance for health and safety of what suppliers do when they're in the field fixing an oil rig or drilling a well. So, compliance is another major area. So, we just went through all of the areas of strategic procurement. I know it's a lot. We have two more areas to go through before we talk about how we think about selecting technology and have a few good jokes at the end. So, let's talk now about procure to pay. So, procure to pay is a combination of two areas. It's e-procurement, electronic procurement, and it's invoice to pay. Now, there's kind of a misnomer as to what e-procurement is, because you're actually doing aspects of e-procurement within your ERP system as well. But when we talk about e-procurement, we're talking about everything you need to buy, which you're not buying within ERP effectively. So, it's buying IT, it's buying MRO, um, it's, 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 it's buying some services. Um, it's, uh, you, you know, intercepting spend that someone in the business is going to do versus someone in the factory. So let's go through what it is. And there's a few too many words on this slide, so I apologize for that. But e-procurement is a lot of things, and they need to work together. So the first thing is shopping. If you want an e-procurement experience, which is as easy to use as Amazon, and that's a cliche. Everybody says buying in business should be as easy as Amazon. But it should be, otherwise people are not going to use the system. They're going to find a way to go around it because it's so complicated. The next element of e-procurement is requisitioning and PO processing. So that ties back to what the purchasing organization is doing. There are many forms of POs. There are blanket POs, there is a standard PO, so it's not cut and dry. Requisitioning is the whole approval and workflow process. So, you know, let's say somebody in my organization, you know, wants to buy uh, an Apple notebook, a MacBook Pro. It's $2,000, but our standard policy for a notebook is $500. But because I've configured my system properly, I see that person is an executive on my team. I see that they do video, they do complex design. Um, their spreadsheets are 20 gigabytes. So they need a powerful computer, and I've configured that in my system. So it, the requisition is approved because of that automatically. Whereas Javier, um, you know, who, who is just doing Excel, goes in and wants to buy a $5,000 computer, and it says no. It says, Javier, buy the $500 computer because that will work for, for Excel and PowerPoint. And that's all you need. So the whole requisitioning and PO process needs to be customized. It needs to be configured. It's not one size fits all. Then we get into other areas of e-procurement. So we have the whole receiving function. How do we receive goods when they come in? How do we mark that? How do we look for quality? Um, how do we integrate into our inventory systems and our accounts payable systems? We also need to set up suppliers and onboard them. That's not just getting details on who their bank is and who the contact person is. That could be getting catalog information, so they have to upload catalogs and maintain them. 
And then we need to think about tying this all together with integration into purchasing cards, um, into budgeting applications, um, you know, and to enable individuals in the company to buy certain categories effectively and drop it from And then in certain cases, we're also using e procurement as an overlay system on top of ERP. Because if you've ever bought from SAP ECC, it's not very user friendly. It's fine for somebody who's 40 or 50 years old and has been in the plant for a long time and is willing to go through five or 10 screens to buy. But for that young person coming up who wants to do five things at once, they want a very fast interface. So you can use e procurement as what we call an additional layer on top of ERP as well to simplify the buying through ERP for the rep materials. Uh, lots of elements to ERP. I won't pretend to be able to go over this now and make it effective. But you know, we'll just start up, let's go through the circle on the outside. So e procurement involves the initial onboarding and management of suppliers, including catalog content. It involves the active management of all of the SKUs that we're buying from suppliers over time to make sure it's correct. It's buying workflow and search and shopping for that user. It's ordering, it's receiving, and then it's managing the life cycle cost as well associated with that supplier relationship and gaining visibility into it. The final area I'm going to talk about is what some organizations call e-invoicing or e-payments. We like to think of these together. We call it invoice to pay. Invoice to pay really is the cardiovascular system and the blood flow of your accounts payable organization. Um, so it is literally a way for your accounts payable organization to slim down, right? So if, if you know, you're 50 years old and you're sedentary and you know, you're 50 pounds overweight, you've got a chance of a heart attack. But if you could slim down overnight and be very efficient and do more with less and get more sleep and have more time with your family uh, and get more done at work and manage the fire strategically, wouldn't you want to do it? Well, that's what Invoice to Pay lets you do. It lets you do more with less. So it lets you transform, in certain cases, inbound invoices into electronic invoices. There's some nuance to it, so it's not as easy as it always sounds. It lets you manage AP workflow effectively. It lets you manage payment terms with suppliers and ideally standardize payment terms and promise a supplier that you'll pay them on a certain date, even if you extend those terms. It lets you manage early payment discounts. It lets you manage working capital, so if you work with your treasury organization and they want to implement a discounting program, you can work with them on it and gain visibility into working capital. And then increasingly it's about managing global compliance. So a lot of the scramble in Latin America, in China, and in India for e-invoicing in the past couple of years has been compliance regulations. Probably the most onerous one is in Brazil, where suppliers um, are not allowed to put goods on a truck unless an invoice is approved and seen by the government before goods are actually shipped. And then the buyer system needs to acknowledge that as well. Mexico is not quite as complicated but still has much greater requirements than the US. China's different as well. So compliance requirements for VAT, because after all, the government is one, one to get paid, taxes, are also complex too. And that falls under this invoice to pay spectrum. So the components of invoice to pay, um, there's really a few. And it's not as complex as some of the other areas, but there's a lot of detail underneath. And there are multiple different types of solutions. So we have what we call invoice processing and management. So it's the management of all those invoices coming in, some of which will be electronic, some of which we will scan, some of which may have to be paper. Um, we have the whole notion of the payables function, so setting payment terms, and then even offering early payment discounts, whether we are funding that or whether we're working with a bank to fund that through supply chain of finance. And then it's the actual payment processing as well. So that's really what invoice to pay is. Okay, so a whole lot of areas. I know we went through a lot. We could spend an 
hour on just one area, but I wanted to get through the landscape. All of these areas matter. You may start with one or two, you may start with all six, but they are all important for the your source to pay technology journey. And the majority of organizations within the Fortune 500, Fortune 1000 in North America are either have current systems in place, are, are replacing those systems, are upgrading them, or are putting in new systems in those areas right now. So how do you buy the best technology? I'm going to use an analogy here about tailoring, and I think this is really important. Um, one thing every American can, can agree on about Donald Trump is that his suits do not fit. I do not know why if you are such a rich man, you cannot buy suits that do not fit. But that is neither here nor there. So why have this when you can have this? So this is a picture of Prime Minister Cameron, or retired Prime Minister Cameron from the UK, who's not an overly thin man, but his suits make him look thin. He has tailored suits. So, how do we think about tailoring technology to our needs so we do not look like Madonna? <laughs> we do something called Solution Map. So Javier and I together, along with a few, of our, a few of our other colleagues two years ago, said, gosh, how can we create a processing system to identify the best fit technology? One size does not fit all. And historically, there were two ways of buying technology. One is, uh, you would call an analyst firm like Gartner, and you'd say, who should I shortlist? They'd say, uh, look at XYZ. And maybe they might try and sell you consulting on top of that to, to do some customization around it. Or you would call Accenture, or KPMG, or Deloitte, and they would do a project for you. And they'd look at what you needed, and they'd say, well, we think that these suppliers fit somewhat similar to, to what you need, and here's how we would prioritize it. Javier and I and Lisa were all guilty as former management consultants of doing that. And I can tell you, there are very smart people in consulting firms, but when they're looking at technology, they're not always going into the details all the time. So we wanted to create a system which was a bit different. So we wanted to create a way of looking at modules. So if you just want spend analysis, you can just look at spend analysis. If you want everything, you can look at it. Um, we also thought, too, that customer views were very important, peer-to-peer. -peer. So we wanted to create a system whereby we would survey customers of these procurement solutions to see if they were happy. So one question we ask is very simple. It's a, it's a net promoter score. Would you recommend this provider to someone else? That one question is hugely insightful in terms of the answer. But we actually asked 20 other questions as well which gets into, was the ROI as promised? Are they innovative? Are they easy to work with? So we thought that input would be valuable. We also thought it was critical to not have one size fits all. So not one chart, but create multiple charts or custom charts for that tailoring. Your organization might want simplicity and low cost and speed. Your organization might want the best friggin' solution in the market today that they don't care it takes a year to implement, but you want every feature. Neither of you is wrong, but it depends on what you want. So, we also saw as well that it used to be you could measure software development in ice ages. SAP would come out with a new version that actually made a difference every couple of years or five years. Today, software development is actually measured in weeks, in months because of the cloud. So we wanted to be able to update this all the time. So we actually update Solution Map quarterly. Um, so in terms of how we do it, we've actually spent 3,000 hours, and I can't make this up, looking at technology since Q2 of 2017. Javier, I, and, and five other people in the organization literally going through demos quarterly to try and find out how good is the technology, and then and asking questions of the architects in those companies to figure out how strong it is in certain fields. So this is actually outdated now. We actually now have 55 providers, we, which we've looked at and surveyed. Um, I think it's close to 100 different modules. And we actually look at 1,250 functional requirements across source of pay and services procurement. 
treatment, which we rate individually with each provider. And then we have an equivalent map for customers in terms of those requirements. And we've done the customer satisfaction surveys with over 750 companies as well. So, why does this matter? Buying the right suit. There's a number of ways to buy a suit. This is an off-the-rack suit. It fits pretty well. Um, so you can go to the store. You know, in the U.S., you would go to Macy's. Um, or, you know, in the U.K., uh, help me out, you would go to Harrods if, if you wanted to spend a lot of money. Um, and you can buy a suit off the rack. And it will generally fit pretty well. And our idea of off the rack was to um, enable organizations to self-identify with a buying persona. So it's a little bit hard to read these here. I'm going to try and use the laser pointer. But we have five standard personas across all those technology areas in this matrix. We have nimble, which is fast, cheap, good, effective, easy. Doesn't mean you want the best technology in terms of feature function, but you want to stand up a system quickly and you want it to be affordable and work to work. Deep is best in class all the way. I want the best in class system feature function. I want to customize it. Um, I want the very best. Configurator is my organization is unique and I want to configure it to my needs. I do not want to get into custom software development because we all know that's dangerous. That's what people did with Ariba 15 years ago. Ariba moved 100% away from that because we all know those projects become dangerous in terms of cost. Um, but configurator means I want to configure it above the code level to my unique processes. Turnkey is I want content with it. I want catalogs preloaded. I want a supplier network. If I'm sourcing, I want templates for how do I buy categories. Um, I might want consulting with it as well from, from the same provider or outsourcing from the same provider. That's our turnkey persona. And then we have Basically, we call it the CIO appeasement persona. This is organizations who have a very strong IT organization who want to be involved. So they want to strongly align and integrate with their SAP system or their Oracle system or their JD Edwards system. So, here's where the fun begins. We rank, and it's hard to see all of these, but each quarter we rank all of the vendors on two axes. So the Y axis going up is the analyst score in terms of how that vendor matches up to the capability we've specified in that persona. So we have nimble, deep, configurator, CIO friendly, and turnkey. The x axis is the customer score. So if you're dead average, you're right in the middle. We don't believe in great inflation. So the world is not up and to the right. As many charts are up and to the right, the world isn't up and to the right. If you're average, you're in the middle, and we need to acknowledge that. We actually don't even show people on the maps who are in the lower left, because we want to encourage providers to come in who may be new. Um, and we don't want to scare them away from participating by giving them a bad score. We give them a bad score, we just don't show them. So, this is free. You can go to Spend Matters, and every quarter these slides are updated, and you can self-identify a persona, and you can see how people stack up. What we don't do at this level is give away all the details as to how we did the rankings. So, the next level of buying the suit is having it tailored. So, you can go to a department store, or a men's store, or a women's store, and you can buy a suit. And they can tell you. They can bring it in. They can shorten it. They can make sure that suit, which was off the rack, fits better. Um, and our way of dealing with this is a report we sell which lets people just tailor it. So if you want to see, for example, how SAP and Ariba and Kupo compare for e-procurement, we can show precisely across rolled up areas, so catalog management being one. Um, we, I think, count 15 different areas within catalog management. You can see, are they bottom tier, middle tier, or top tier? And you get the ranking of every vendor, and you can custom weight and, and, and use the data. A lot of consultants today use our data to work with clients in doing this. So, so they use these reports to do that. Or organizations just buy it directly. Um, the next level is buying the suit made for you, which is what uh, the Brits would call the smoke tailoring. So uh, this is where the charts get really small. But I wanted to give you a sense of the 
level of detail we look at. So for e-procurement, we have all of these functional areas which we assess vendors on quarterly. And uh, the top one is catalog management. And for catalog management, we have all these specifications which we're rating vendors on. And this is technical stuff. This is stuff that Javier and I really enjoy. Like, we'll do it at 5 o'clock and we don't even need a beer yet because we're having fun. So if you're a technical geek, it's fun to take vendors through this and actually see how they perform looking at technology. But those areas map to questions as to how a procurement organization would care about these things. So, for example, you know, how important is it that the catalog management system as part of e-procurement support planned, non-planned, and repetitive purchasing scenarios? So, how do you bundle items together? Is that important to you, that somebody should be able to buy eight things together and get a discounted price? How important uh, is cross-referencing part numbers? How important is it to have buying policies you know, configurable based on the specific item? So we translate the techno speak which we take the vendors through to business questions as to how this stuff matters. And from that, we can create a one-to-one -one map, which is your own unique map as to how do you buy technology. And we do this, um, initially we did it in a matter of, of weeks, but now we can actually get it down into days so people can move quickly on the questions. So the notion here is being able to do what we call mass customization because we collect the data once. So, or you could try the one size fits all approach. You could uh, purchase the suit off the rack without looking at the size. Um, so I just got a couple more slides. I wasn't sure if I would have time to get to them, but I do. But some, some parting advice on the sector. So there's, there's an African proverb which says, that when the sun comes up, it doesn't matter whether you're a lion or a gazelle, you've got to start running, right? You're either the hunted or you're, or you're the hunter. And everybody's got to be running. So, the challenge, I think, from running, when it comes to looking at procurement technology, is we can't have what's called cement shoes, right? So literally, imagine our shoes being anchored in the ground. And there's a lot of reason our shoes get anchored. We have inflexible old systems. We have silos in our business. We have a winner-take-all approach. IT says, we like SAP, so we should buy everything from SAP. Maybe that's the right choice, maybe it's not the right choice. But the winner-take-all approach is not the way to evaluate technology when you take it down to all the different levels. Um, we have sole source, right? So we're going to go with one vendor because we have done that in the past. We believe one size fits all. The best system for you is the best system for you. We're worried about failure. We're, we're worried about what we call VUCA. So VUCA is volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. And ambiguity. So for many reasons, we don't take an approach which aligns our needs with what the supply market can deliver. So as we think about this safari, if we will, um, and this, this uh, you know, desert uh, in Africa, how do we make animals dance, right? So how do we get rid of those concrete shoes? I, I, I love this picture of the elephant skipping rope. So how do we, how do, we do that? The first thing um, is the ears, right? We need to think like an elephant. Elephants have big ears. That means they can listen to people in the business, right? We're listening to stakeholders. So we're buying systems which support the business, which support procurement. The customer, the internal customer, should be the focal point. So that frontline user, that general counsel, that CFO, that treasurer, whomever it is, we in procurement buying systems need to think about supporting all of our customers. We need to tap systems which enable suppliers to deliver innovation and to be flexible. Suppliers, and I say this, having registered and having our, our CFO and Director of Finance register on all these different systems so we can get paid from companies, many of these systems are horrible, right? Many of these supplier portals are a nightmare to do business with. If you're a supplier, the last thing you want to do is have to fill out 100 questions, which are the same questions for every company. So we need to think about how do we simplify things for suppliers? How do we think about agile design? How do we take best practice from outside and bring it in? 
We don't need to hire McKinsey or Boston Consulting Group to tell us what our best practice is. We can bring it in. It exists out there today. And then we need to right-size our policies and tell them. So, we have the dancing elephant with a uh, jump rope, and now we have the uh, lion riding a mountain bike. So, um, how do we think about the right equipment? A few things. The cloud. Do not ever think about buying software behind the firewall anymore. There are so many reasons the cloud is superior today, even for highly complex strategic systems. If you're worried about different locations spying on you, you can host data in different areas. So your e-procurement system can have a data instance in North America, in South America, in Europe, and in China. Don't worry about security, it doesn't have to cross. But the cloud enables us to get things updated all the time. It enables us to hold a vendor accountable to action. Because if, if we just bought software, the vendor's not accountable. The cloud makes the vendor accountable. We need to think about modules and suites, either both mixing and matching. We need to think about integration, so how do we tie everything together? Networks, right? What is the network effect of using a technology? It could be a supplier network. It could be a network of other organizations using it which are like me, which I can get benchmark data from. Analytics is not just spend analysis. Analytics needs to sit on top. Analytics is a layer of governance we have in the procurement. We need to think about how we guide processes. You know, how do we guide users, whether they're in sourcing, like a category manager, or they're in the business to make the right decision? So that is what is needed um, as you think about this journey to technology. Um, and again, lots of areas, lots of excitement, lots of detail, but if you keep these things in mind, you won't go wrong in the end. So with that, thank you for giving me an hour of your life. I know it was a lot of stuff, but I hope you get at least a little bit as excited as I get about this technology, because it really does matter.